I'm not sure if anyone here has noticed, but sometimes life can get really hard. Life can be devastating at times, and life can be outright heartbreaking. As long as we are living, we will have struggles. We will go through trials. We will go through stormy seasons and experience storms that seem to come out of nowhere. Jesus says in John 16, that we will have tribulation. And that's a promise we can claim for ourselves. But be of good cheer, because he has overcome this world. So how can we be of good cheer and survive any storm, no matter how severe? And one of the wonderful things about the word of God is that it never changes. It never changes, and it will, for all of eternity, stand the test of time. And it is and will remain a rock-solid foundation in which we can build our lives upon. Let me say a quick prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you would be with each individual here today. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would quell any anxieties and nervousness on my part, that I can deliver the message that we've been working on together. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so this Sabbath, I'd like to focus on two Bible stories and put some real-life principles out that I hope can be as encouraging to you as they have been to me. Uh, we're going to be mainly in Jonah today and Mark, uh, so if you can turn with me to Jonah. I don't have a PowerPoint, so the verses will not be up front. I will be reading, so you don't have to, but if you can read along and like to, it uh, be a good time to get there. Uh, scripture tells us of two different men on two different occasions who slept through a storm, and Jonah is one of them. And Jonah starts out, now the, word, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from, from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so, be what God will think of upon us, that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause is this evil upon us? What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, for that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought, and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it into the land, and they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now that was a lot to read, but I want us to kind of, not in a contemplative kind of weird way, but to, but to kind of put yourself there in that kind of a storm. It was a really rough storm. These people were afraid for their lives. And we'll touch more on this when, about the storm ceasing, but I wanted to go through... Jonah's experience that he had in, in his storm. Now we see here that the Jonah was running away from God. 
He didn't want to go to Nineveh. Was he afraid? Was it his pride? Did he hate the people of Nineveh? He knew that if they repented from their evil ways, that God would forgive them and not destroy them. And he didn't seem to want that. For whatever reason, he ran away. He ran away from the Lord. He went and purchased a ticket for a ship that was going in the opposite direction of where God called him to go. He even paid to get away. And we just read that God sent that storm. You see, running away from God always leads to a storm. Sin will always lead to a storm. We read here that the storms or circumstances that test us and develop us can be sent by God according to his good will and purpose. God sent this storm to wake Jonah up from his backsliding and bring him to his senses. These types of storms are allowed, permitted by God for our own good, to change us, to make us more like Christ, that we may fulfill his purposes in our lives. Many of our storms are a result of what we've done, or what we're doing, or what we're not doing. Unwise living. If we choose not to follow God's guidance on health, we will have stormy health. If we're, if we're unloving, unforgiving, or selfish, we'll have stormy relationships. Many storms come as a result of our own laziness or lack of discipline. And they will come, but they are permitted by a loving Savior. Sin will bring us into difficulty. We can't carry on in sin and expect to maintain a life free from storms. If we violate God's law, God's design and purpose of things, sinning against our bodies, sinning relationships or God, there are natural consequences. We've been designed to know, serve, and love Him. And He will allow storms to arise, to grow us, to develop us into Christ's likeness. Jonah had run away from God, gone in the opposite direction, and God sent this storm to adjust his attitude. His hatred, his pride, his rebellion was transformed by this storm. Hebrews 12, 6 8 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God deal, dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? If we are to grow in Christ's likeness, we will go through storms. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 10, Paul writes, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. There are allowed circumstances that go beyond our ability to endure. There is a purpose that we would learn not to rely on ourselves, that our faith would grow, that we would come together knowing that he is the one who delivers us. Faith and humility coming together and growing together, looking to our only Savior, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, Paul wrote, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will bo rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong." Even praying that God would remove the thorn, God let it remain, saying, My grace is sufficient for you. I want to teach you about your weakness, about my power, about my grace, and about your need for me. He teaches us through suffering, and we may not like it, but it is his way. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. God is always working a good purpose to every storm. Jonah created a storm by his own wishes and tried to face the storm alone, and we can see how that worked out for him. Now let's turn to Mark chapter 4, if you're following along, and we'll start in verse 35. And 35 picks up right after Jesus had given a series of sermons to a crowd so large that he had to speak from a boat that was anchored off in the water at the Sea of Galilee. And we'll start in chapter 4, verse 35. 
Now, and Jesus was fully human. He had worked, a hard, he had worked hard that day in tons of preaching, teaching, public speaking, Bible studies, seeking out, heal, seeking out and healing the sick and the lost, dealing with all kinds of people from, every, from all different walks of life, all of whom wanted something from him. Jesus no doubt must have suffered from physical exhaustion during his earthly ministry. So he just had an intense day of ministry, pouring himself out all day and dealing with the crowds. He says to his disciples, let's get in the boat and let's go to the other side. And this is where we pick up in 35. Mark 4.35 says, In the same day, when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. So what we have to understand here is that Jesus had told them, Let's get in. Let's go to the other side together. He requested that they go together. And this was Christ's suggestion to load up and cross the Sea of Galilee. And we can never go wrong listening to God's word and following or going with him. Verse 36 says, And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And I think this is cool because it says there were other boats with him. There were, there were more people there. There were multiple other eyewitnesses that, that got to see what happened that day. In verse 37, And there, there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full, full of water. Uh, if you're out on the water and this sort of thing starts to happen, it's, it's not good. It's actually obviously very, very bad. Now, many of the disciples made their living on the Sea of Galilee. They were seasoned seamen, but this storm got so bad that they were utterly terrified. They knew that Jesus was, was with them, but still they were afraid for their lives, even though Jesus was right in the boat with them. Now, this, this is a picture of, of the Sea of Galilee, and it's about 700 feet below sea level, and it's surrounded by mountains with these trough-like valleys in there. And from what I've read, that the winds can come up out of nowhere, and awful storms happen often. And in verse 37, we have one of these storms. It says, this was a great storm. The waves were beating against the boat, and the water was coming in, and the inside was full of water. Verse 38, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on the pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou, thou not that we perish? When the storm is raging and everything seems out of control, Jesus is fast asleep. But when his children call out to him, he knows them and he wakes up. And when we cry out to our Savior, just like them, he hears us. Right in the midst of the, of the storm we're going through, he is listening and he does respond. They cry out to him, Care, care ye thou not that we perish? They're like, how can you be asleep when we're in the middle of this huge storm? The storm that's going to kill us. <laughs> they knew he was there, but seemingly they forget who it is with them. The creator, the sustainer of all life was in the boat with them. No matter what storm we're in, whether it's a financial storm, relationship storm, a health storm, a storm of habit and, or, and seemingly unbearable temptation, if we're walking with him, Jesus, our real and personal Savior, he's in the boat with us, in the midst of our storm. Mark 4.39 says, And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Jesus rebuked the wind, and he spoke to the sea, saying, Peace, be still. Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. We've all seen the weather turn bad. We've seen storms slowly move in, in the almost eerie, quiet and calm, quiet scene, where off in the distance you see dark clouds coming in, moving ominously closer. And as it gets closer, you can feel the gentle breeze kick in. If you're on or around water, you see the drip drop of what's coming in the rain, in the first sprinkles. We see the signs of the trees off in the distance, giving clue to the stronger winds that are about to hit. And the wind starts to blow whitecaps in the, in the once calm water. The blowing rain blasts the now present waves with the pattern of the wind, but yet it's almost unnoticeable because of the torment of the water, which is now so violently turbulent, we can't even see the other side. This was the storm they were in. The boat is getting tossed, seemingly destroyed. The water is beating the boat so bad that it's now full. And that's when they called to Jesus. 
Jesus responded by rebuking the wind and telling the seas to be still, and immediately it all stopped. Instantly, no wind. Instantly, no rain. Instantly, glassy water across the Sea of Galilee. The Bible doesn't say if the sun immediately came out and that the clouds vanished, but there was an immediate calm and a great peace. An amazing thing to witness. Verse 40, And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? So there was a great storm, and then there was a great peace. And Mark 40, 41 and 40 and 41 say, And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? They feared exceedingly, or they were extremely afraid. They were in the middle of one of the most difficult and trying times of, the, of their life, in the midst of a terrible and frightening storm, in a boat that is now full of water, and they were afraid for their very lives. Jesus speaks a word, and a great calm comes over the sea. And as a result of seeing this, the disciples transition from a great fear for their lives to a different but still extreme fear. What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the same calm that came to Jonah when, when, when he was thrown out. Calm seas, no wind, no rain. The storm ceased. This extreme fear the disciples were experiencing isn't like a scary fear, like horrified fear. It's a reverent fear. A respectful, a, a respect is demanded. A reverential fear. A fear of men that watch the very forces of nature hear and obey Jesus' words. At the command of the Creator, there was a great calm, a calm that resulted in a great fear that this man, who as the Messiah, was the Messiah, and God is who he says he is. There are undoubtedly going to be times where we are in the middle of one of life's great storms. Maybe you're in the middle of one right now. Sometimes we'll just get out of one before we need a brace for the next one. We just need to remember that if we know Christ as our personal Savior, we can rest assured that the storms are allowed in our lives to strengthen our faith, to refine our characters, and to prepare us to be fit for heaven. And to show us that He is our sole provider. He is our God and our Savior. He is the one who will get us through these life storms. He is the one that will give us strength to overcome. No matter what the storms of life may look like, may we move closer to Him. We're going to face the storms of life no matter what. But we need to face the storms with trust. Trust that he's working all things for our good. We can and should, of course, pray that God would remove the storm. But if it doesn't end, to sustain us in it. Trust and prayer are the two things that will get us through every storm. We can't stop or control the trials of life. But we can survive life's storms by putting our faith and trust in our Heavenly Father. I pray that we would all come to love and understand God with a sobering, immediate storm calming, reverential, fear-inducing love. May God bless us all. Dear Lord, there's not a person in this room that isn't going through a trial of some sort, going through a storm, has gone through or will go through. Lord, I ask that we would just remember to keep our eyes on you, to draw close to you, and know that you're in the boat with us. In Jesus' name, amen.